Kishoten Ketsu is a traditional plot structure in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean literature and poetry, and is touted as story without conflict. And ironically today, I'm going to show you how to use this storytelling technique to drive combat encounters in Dungeons & Dragons. Kishoten Ketsu is divided into four parts or acts, unlike the traditional Western three-act narrative structure. Ki is introduction, Sho is the development, Ten is the twist, Ketsu is the resolution. Here's a specific example by the poet Sanyo Rai. Daughters of Itoya in the Honmachi of Osaka. The elder daughter is 16 and the younger one is 14. Throughout history, daimyos killed the enemy with bows and arrows. The daughters of Itoya kill with their eyes. Okay, so Sanyo Rai might be kind of a skis bag. Uh, we're gonna come back to this core design philosophy, but that's the how. Let's first touch on the why. Goals. Your goals as a dungeon master should first and foremost be that you and your players are having fun. Everything we do from here on out is in service to you and your friends having a good time. Note that a good time varies for different players. Some players are far more into role play than battle. Though this video will focus heavily on battle design, I'd also like to challenge the idea that roleplay and battle are fundamentally separate aspects of D&D. In a good game, every battle is a roleplaying experience. You do what your character would do, not necessarily what you would do, or what's most optimal. During combat, every action you take is informed by the personality and relationships you have built and are currently building in-game. Let's move on to encounter design. In the DM's guide, you'll hear that a party can handle on a given adventuring day about six encounters. When I dive into how I create my encounters, you might freak out and think, how am I supposed to do this six times for a single game? The simple answer is you don't. I think those rules were designed for the simple kick down the door, kill three slimes, kick down the next door. These encounters can be fun, but they're not necessarily what I'm going for in my games. We are now in the key of Kisho Tenketsu, the setup. We're gonna need some monsters. In my encounters, monsters fall within five different categories. Goons, archers, bruisers, support, and the big bad evil guy. Goons are your classic mooks. They've got low health and low damage, but there are a lot of them. They fill out a battlefield and are lots of fun to kill. Archers are any enemy that tries to shoot from cover. They will run away from enemies and try to pick off the weak ones, or pepper the tank with just a storm of flak. Bruisers are the big boys, and they get all the attention. They have lots of health, they hit like a truck, and honestly, it's probably better to ignore them if you can. If you can. They're coming for you. <laughs> Supports are your spellcasters or tricksters that buff your baddies or stall your goodies. Occasionally, they can toss out a big damage spell like Cone of Cold or Fireball. Big bad evil guy? Well, they're your boss monster. They can fill any of the other roles I just laid out, but they do it much better than those other fools. I'll talk more about making a dope boss in another video, because we've already got a lot to cover in this one. Here's an example scenario. A fifth level party is trying to stop a local war band of greenskins from raiding traveling caravans. So they've been searching through a forest looking for them. Renee the Rogue stealths ahead in the forest and discovers the goblins are lying in wait for a potential caravan. She goes back to the party and tells her friends, Barry the Barbarian, free to the fighter, and Carl the Cleric what lies ahead. She got an okay perception check, and saw a few goblins along the path, as well as a chained ogre. At fifth level, they should be able to handle this, but they decide to sneak up and attack from behind. Unfortunately, Carl trips on something, and a loud bell rings. The surprise attack is ruined, but the fight is on. Frida rolls the highest initiative and rushes at the nearest goblin, easily slamming it. Renee hides behind a tree and shoots a crossbow, killing another goblin. This is already looking pretty good for the heroes, and really bad for the dungeon master, right? Wrong. Remember, these goblins are my goons. Books, chaff, peons, you get it. They are the pawns of your chessboard. They're there to get killed. Get them in the right place, however, and they just might turn the whole thing around. For example, one of the goblins rushes over and unleashes the ogre, pointing him in the direction of the party. Now the party has to deal with my bruiser. He runs over and slams Barry, who hadn't yet had time to rage. Ouch! A few of my goblins take cover from behind trees and take pot shots. These are my archers. Though they have the same stats as my goons, I put them in this fight specifically as ranged support. They're gonna be troublesome and slippery as heck since I'm using their bonus actions to hide. Out of the bushes comes my goblin shaman. He's my support. He's gonna try and keep the ogre alive and debuff any enemies he can. He uses a homebrew ability called that basically casts Blade Ward on the Ogre, giving him resistance to physical damage. Now this is mostly a stolen trick from Matthew Colville's action-oriented monsters, and one I do often when I put casters on the enemy team. 
Give your monsters abilities instead of spells. Instead of worrying about whether the range of cure wounds is touch or 60 feet, I say he casts <laughs> Instead of casting shield, I say he uses <laughs> It's easier, and I don't have to spend a lot of time in the fight flipping through the player's handbook trying to find details that don't matter. I have a plan for what this monster is going to do during this fight, and that's all that matters. This also has the hidden benefit of preventing rules lawyer party members from policing your monster's abilities. I don't always do this if I'm just tossing a monster in a fight, but if I've got time to prep, it can be a really good add. So, what was a simple mop em up fight is now a lot more interesting. What do the players do? try to go after the Goblin Shaman and risk getting shot down by the archers, or take down the Ogre to avoid his massive slam attack even though he's now resistant to the Barbarian's damage. Let's pause, because this entire encounter was designed using Ki Shoten Ketsu, and we're already halfway through. Let's break it down. Ki. Introduction. There are goblins waiting on the road in ambush. Show. Development. These goblins have an Ogre and a Shaman. Oh no, now we hit 10. The twist. Remember when Carl tripped to start the fight? He didn't just trip on a stick, he tripped on a wire. A wire connected to... dot dot dot. The twist should reframe the entire fight, and not just make it harder. Did the wire just ring the bell, alerting enemies to the attack? Or did the bell trigger a series of falling logs, separating the party? Did the wire connect to the cage of a merchant who is now slowly descending into a pot of boiling oil for the ogre's dinner? The twist should add a ticking clock, new stakes, or new goals to an encounter. This is now what the battle is about, and changes what everyone was about to do. Finally, Ketsu. Conclusion. The party managed to defeat the enemies and rescue the merchant before she was boiled alive, but only barely. This merchant wants to reward the party and will act as their ally in town, but she also tells you of a plot, that another merchant in town hired these goblins to attack all the caravans but their own, and off we go to another story. Before we wrap up, I want to offer a warning. While my encounter design emphasizes dynamic storytelling, it also amplifies the difficulty. All of a sudden, the party members need to take actions in combat that are not combat, so design your encounters with that in mind, and maybe lower the challenge rating. That's it. I could give a lot more examples of how to use the different combat roles, like how one of the goons could trigger the twist, or the support could cast a spell that acts as the twist, but I think I've got your gears turning. If you only take one thing away from this video, I hope it's that you're now building your encounters with intentionality. Share this video with a friend or a DM or a friendly DM if you think it's helpful. I can't wait to see people tell me that this is uh, actually stupid and not good at all. My name is Ben DeHart, and remember, the twist was inside you all along. See ya.